So my question to Braden is, uh, reconciliation has become the key mechanism for shaping the moral conscience of our country in regard to its first peoples and our past and present um, by educating and building understanding about past violence, injustice, oppression and racism against our first peoples whilst devising ways to walk, work towards addressing this past and its legacy impacting the present. Reconciliation Australia's RAP approach offers ways for organisations, businesses and universities to engineer reconciliation into their workplaces, communities and networks. Do you think reconciliation can evolve from tokenistic fluffy rhetorics, rhetoric into real concrete actions of structural and cultural change to bring meaningful, lasting and equitable change for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students, staff and communities. And can you give some examples of this? Um, the answer, I think, to that question is probably not. And that doesn't mean we don't do it. Um, I think raps are, we need a rap for the nation, you know what I mean? I think we need to start there. Uh, I think raps are only as good as the leadership that collaborate to develop them. And I think that within an institution that highlights just how colonial university spaces are because it asks people to commit to things. Um, and that request for commitment, I think, is important. It depends what the answer is, I think. Now, in terms of examples of cultural shift, that, I think, is easier to achieve. So I think at our university, the visibility of Indigenous people within the, the institution and the importance of our contribution most certainly was quite significantly changed by the existence of a RAP. So respect for our pro protocols, respect for our ways of engaging and the value of that were very much um, an important contribution that our RAP plan made. Structurally, limited. So I think we had uh, all of a sudden Aboriginal representation on key governance bodies, uh, which sounds minimal, but having Aboriginal people on Senate, on Academic Council, on the University Education Committee, on, on, across the whole institution, uh, changed the conversation at those tables. So that made a significant, uh, significant change for us. Um, one area where we didn't do well was uh, the appointment of senior Indigenous leaders to the executive. So we said we'd appoint someone at PVC, DVC level. It never happened. It was in our wrap. It's still in our wrap. It hasn't happened yet. So commitment is there as long as there's dollars behind it as well. So I think um, for me that's an important consideration and, and commitment really means putting the resources behind it. So it can do good things but it's limited by real commitment, I think. Um, now, given that in universities most members of senior exec are non-Indigenous, um, I wanted to ask you, Fred, what do you see the role of non-Indigenous allies in the, in the project of reconciliation in universities particularly? So, thanks very much. Uh, so, um, it's uh, non-Indigenous allies who have to do the work. Let's start with that. Uh, reconciliation uh, isn't about meeting uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples halfway. It's about walking 99% of the way towards them. That's uh, kind of my understanding. I welcome contradiction from Gajah Kerry. But uh, so um, it's, it's we who have to do most of the work. Uh, and I uh, say this in a spirit of some optimism, despite the recent unraveling of some cultural change that was done during my lifetime. And it's important to acknowledge that there has been unraveling in the last few years. But during my lifetime, we, uh, uh, I grew up in the United States, and I grew up in a racist uh, society, and I grew up in a sexist society, and a lot of people did a lot of hard work over the uh, intervening 70 years to wind some of that uh, bullshit back from where it was when I was born. And, uh, and there was uh, reason to be uh, optimistic if you knew where the baseline was. 
okay? If you, you know, were born in the 1970s, you might have thought, well, it's still pretty crappy, but uh, if you were born in the, grew up in the 1950s, you saw a lot of change and uh, in a positive direction. So, so I actually think that uh, we can do this kind of cultural work on ourselves uh, and that I'm a little less uh, wedded to the leadership model, I have to say. I think it's important that the leadership be signaling and incentivizing. There's no doubt about that, but I think you have to weave it in to everyday life. Uh, you have to make it part of uh, the protocols for everyday interactions at every place uh, and at every time and the history of the institution. That's the way you create the change uh, in the culture by setting new ground rules for how people behave, by setting new ground rules for how people uh, talk, by introducing new topics into discussion and ensuring that they get discussed and that they remain on the agenda. Uh, you have to do that, and if you do that and do that and do that, uh, over the course of a generation or more, you wind up with people having different attitudes as a default. And I'm not saying they can't be moved off of those attitudes, because that's what we've seen in the last couple of years. But you have new attitudes as a default. You have new openness to others as a default. You have new uh, uh, protocols for interaction uh, as a default. And that's what we, uh, you know, I'll be dead before this happens, but uh, uh, that's what we're aiming at is, uh, a situation in which Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people can meet white fellas on a basis of equality and a basis of mutual humility. Uh, uh, humility is the key, uh, but you don't get humility just by drinking uh, uh, some uh, uh, beverage. You get humility by working at it every day. So I'm an institutional guy. Uh, I'm not a leadership guy. So I think this isn't going to happen just because. Uh, it's not going to happen without some inspiration from the leadership element, but it's only going to happen if we weave it into the institution. And uh, that's uh, my story, and I'm sticking to it. Um, so, but uh, the role of uh, uh, stories is very important in all of this, and, uh, and uh, I, I want to share some stories from my own past at, at a later point in the conversation. But we've got a real live storyteller over at the other end of the... Uh, and I've had the, one of the great privileges of uh, uh, getting acquainted with the people in our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander unit is uh, getting to know Graham a little bit and having him share some of his wonderful fiction with me. I feel very privileged. And, and so Graham's a storyteller. And uh, he's, uh, as he's already said, he's doing a, a, an MPhil. He, I don't know whether he mentioned that it. it's in creative writing. Uh, and uh, uh, he's uh, written a book. It's going to be published. I mean, how cool is that? And, uh, and uh, um, one, one of the things that, uh, that I kind of think as an outsider anyway, and again, I uh, you know, await correction, is that there's a strong emphasis in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures on storytelling. Uh, and, uh, and I would be really interested in the, the differences and similarities in the cultural traditions of storytelling that are indigenous, so to speak, to your communities and those that are the kinds of things you learn about in a creative writing, uh, you know, master's program. Uh, you know, uh, are there different narrative forms? Are there different ways of voicing the stories? Are there different uh, ways of putting uh, different characters on the stage? Uh, and so on. And how, how could that, uh, those differences, if they exist, how could they teach us something about how to position ourselves uh, in relation, uh, myself as a white fellow, in relation to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. Mm -hmm. um, thanks for that, Fred. I was thinking about your question um, this morning, and I've been reading a Native American scholar by the name of Thomas King, um, and he's a uh, he did uh, the the messy lectures. They're online, actually, if you can um, get an opportunity to see them, and. Uh, it, the very first thing he says in his, um, his book is the thing about stories is that that's all we are. And I think that is, um, is pertinent when we look at storytelling, but it, particularly First Nations storytelling, because the game has changed in the way that we tell our stories. Um, 
So the written form of storytelling is, is a relatively new thing for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, you know, 200 odd years. Um, and, and also with Native American um, storytelling. So Thomas talks about the fact that some stories um, from his um, peoples used to take days to tell and they would always subtly change. And, and it's, it's also true to um, some Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities where you would have these narratives that would subtly change over time. Whereas when we look at the written word, there is something definite about that, um, uh, unmovable. And that's unique. And I think that's an ontological difference in, um, in, uh, in our way of knowing and looking at the world and that of the colonizer. And we see that in everything around us now. Um, we see that in policy, in all types of communication. And um, we possibly see that in our reconciliation action plans, but that's another story, isn't it? <laughs> um, so I'd like to just quickly tell a story about the sorts of things that I had to do in, as an Indigenous writer, um, writing from an Indigenous perspective, and the sort of cultural competency or pro protocols that I had to go through in telling a, a story from my own perspective. And I think it's, um, it's important because it's, as an institution, UQ is a big institution and, and predominantly a white institution. So as an Indigenous writer, I had to do certain things to even possibly, I guess, for lack of a better word, authenticate my Aboriginality in storytelling. So where does that sit in reconciliation from a white institution as well? What sort of things should we be doing here in this space to, to authenticate our want to reconcile with the past? Um, so I wrote a book, it's titled Borderland, and it's going to be released next year. I was hoping June, but it might be a little bit later. <laughs> um, so I, I've written this story, it's a coming of age story, it's a young adult fiction. It's about a, a young guy who's moving towards um, uh, his community, which is the Gungri mob, and he's, you know, figuring out his, himself. He's been brought up as um, predominantly a white, um, a young white man, but he's, he's indigenous. So during the process of writing that, I had to consistently get in contact with the Gungri Land Council and show them multiple versions of this book. Um, and during provisional to the contract that I signed with Ashet, there was a cultural sensitive edit that was to be done. Um, and even in doing that edit, I found it very difficult to find an editor um, that was willing to work on the book because apparently, um, for some Indigenous writers, I was writing outside of my community, but they didn't actually know what I had done to engage with community members in the writing of my novel. Um, so we see even part of the, the, the project of colonisation that a lot of Indigenous people are pitted against one another when it comes to um, authenticity of identity. Um, and that fits into the reconciliation plan, I think, as well. It, this all fits into the reconciliation plan. Um, so through that process, I was, um, I was able to engage with, a, with an editor, and I see myself now um, at the cusp of putting out my story. Um, but I'm very aware that, that it, it is cemented in, it, in an artifact now. Like I, I, you know, and I just, I have to react to the response to that book rather than change it as an oral tradition, if that makes sense. Thank you. Yep. So, Ronaldo. Um, <laughs> um, we had a, a brief yarn yesterday about what I was going to ask you, um, and I hope you've been thinking about it. Uh, <laughs> so, um, I, I just wanted to know, um, Where does decoloniality and um, decolonization fit within um, 
a reconciliation process. I, th I don't know precisely what are uh, the history of this program in Australia. Uh, Reconciliation Act, but uh, when I think by my point, or my viewpoint, I think we must to reconciliate with our ancestor. Uh, and our ancestors are not in homogenic or uh, natural or kind of culture, but a very complex, conflictual, uh, sometimes tragic history of uh, so this history we bring inside oh, with us, everyone, with everyone history. So I, I think that the first challenge is to reconciliate with our ancestral, ancestral histories and recognize their values and their conflicts and their contradictions. In the colonial perspective, I think is, it would be help us to overcome the pattern of subordination. Uh, uh, the pattern of um, that, that, that understand one or myself by opposition in relationship with the other. Uh, by this logic, this is a formal logic, uh, is def um, normally we define, I define myself by opposition for, uh, for what I am not, the opposite. So when I imagine the opposite of me, I fight this opposite to affirm myself. This is the logic, the formal logic, the oppositional logic that sustain the, uh, uh, the construction of our identity in modernity, in colonial perspective. But when we uh, review the original cultures, they are based in other logics, logics of reciprocity. I am myself by reciprocity of uh, with the, the others. Uh, complementarity, transversality, eh? not opposition between me and the other, me and the collective. So I think that uh, in the colonial perspective, we must to reconciliate ourself, our mind, our relationships, our institutions uh, with this epistemic view based on reciprocity, complementarity, transversality, so in a communitarian perspective. And improve these ways to organize our relationships in day by day and in institutional reflections is more on under the uh, epistemic point of view, but uh, it implies a pedagogical uh, perspective. Uh, for example, Paulo Freire proposed that the education is not the transmission of the knowledge to by from one to another, but the dialogue, the education is dialogue between one with the other about their common challenges or com common projects. 
So it implies uh, an attitude to listen more than to talk, uh, to cooperate more to command, uh, a perspective to bring a collectivity and co communitarian context more than uh, self-affirmation. So uh, I think the, this would be the main challenges for us in the perspective of uh, uh, reconciliation in a larger sense. Thank you.